afternoon. Just as there's nothing like a full church with people standing in the aisles, it's also, um, especially in sharing philosophy here at the School of Philosophy, there's nothing like a full lecture hall. There may be larger places on campus, but this is our home. And um, we're very pleased and, and honored to have in our home today here in the School of Philosophy for our fall 2000 and nine lecture series, The Issue of Truth, in honor of Robert Sokolowski, Professor Alastair McIntyre. Professor McIntyre is the Reverend John A. O'Brien Senior Research Professor of Philosophy in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. He is a permanent Senior Research Fellow of Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. Our customary introductions for the fall lecture series include mentioning where speakers studied, where they have taught, what their areas of interest are, and what they have published. In the case of our speaker today, Alastair McIntyre, these conventions seem less necessary, especially when he comes to speak with us. Uh, as we welcome back to our campus this philosopher and scholar whose work is so highly regarded by us and studied so carefully, with books that begin with Marxism and interpretation in 1953, and continue today with God Philosophy Universities, a selective history of the Catholic philosophical tradition which appeared this year. In between, of course, are such influential works as After Virtue, Whose Justice, Which um, Rationality, Three Rival Virtues of Moral Inquiry, and so on. One sign of our high regard and appreciation is the fact that a number of our doctoral students have written or are preparing to write dissertations on the thought of Professor McIntyre, which means not only that our students, but also our faculty who direct them want to share in the philosophical reflection that he has advanced. And so we are especially happy and, and pleased to present uh, Professor Alistair McIntyre in this series, who will speak on the topic, Ends and Endings. It's a peculiar pleasure and privilege to be here today, uh, partly because I'm always glad to visit this department, a department whose teachers have contributed more to the Catholic philosophical tradition than I think any other philosophy department in this country or elsewhere in the last 20 to 30 years. And it's a particularly gratifying occasion that we honor Robert Sokolowski, whose contributions to all our thinking have been of a quite different order than that that we commonly expect from colleagues. And so I'm extremely grateful for being allowed to take part in this. I'll begin with ends and end with endings. <laughs> Many types of things have endings, lives, leases, eras, journeys, stories. It's with the endings of stories that I'll be concerned. So although I shall begin with the arguments of a philosopher, I'll end with the tales of novelists. About ends, we need to note at once that the concept of an end has a range of different applications, and that just because of the heterogeneous ways in which we ascribe ends, the concept of an end is bound to seem problematic. Robert Sokolowski has distinguished three, among them the ascriptions of ends to non-human living beings, which have the ends that they do because of the nature of the species to which they belong. A frog achieves its end when it has become perfectly what it had it in it to become by reason of being a frog of that particular species. It will have developed through stages towards that end, provided that first, its habitat afforded it what it needed and secondly, that it had not been the victim of parasites, diseases, fungi, or predators. As with frogs, so also with Sokolowski's examples, trees, spiders, zebras. We also ascribe ends to types of activity, types of practice, 
in which human agents engage. Activities as different as those of physicians, furniture makers, musicians. The end of the activities of a physician is to heal, that of a furniture maker to make excellent furniture, that of a musician to perform excellently for an audience. Sokolowski's principal concern is to distinguish and contrast such ends with what may happen to be the purposes of this or that physician, furniture maker or musician on particular occasions, purposes that may be indefinitely various, to win money or reputation, to please teachers or spouses, to pass time on a boring day, or indeed to achieve the ends of the practice in which they are engaged. What the purpose of any particular physician or furniture maker or musician is, is up to her or him. But the ends of each practice are what they are, independently of the purposes of individuals who engage in it. It is, of course, true that no practice will be sustained whose practitioners don't, by and large, make the achievement of its ends a principal object of their purposes. But as Sokolowski emphasises, ends are one thing and purposes another. The criteria in virtue of which we ascribe ends to trees, spiders, frogs and zebras are obviously different from those in virtue of which we ascribe ends to the practices of physicians, furniture makers and musicians. Why then do we use the same expression in both cases? What makes this double use more than a pun? It's to the point that we treat both non-human animals and human practices as having determinate natures and that we have to identify the end of either animal or practice if we are to make it intelligible that the activities characteristic of each species of animal or of each type of practice are what they are, and if we are to distinguish that in living beings or practitioners which is movement towards their ends from that which is accident or aberration. There is that is to say, in both cases, a story to be told about individuals, whether animals or practitioners, a story that has as its plot the actions and passions that lead to success or failure by that individual to achieve the relevant end. What counts as the ending of such a story is determined therefore in part by the nature of that end. Note, however, that there are differences between the two cases in respect of the kind of story to be told. So far as non-human living beings are concerned, what purposes they have is determined by their nature. And in exercising those powers that enable them to be successful in the pursuit of just those purposes, to hunt for food, say, or to escape from predators, to mate, to nurture their young, they move towards the achievement of their end. But for the human practitioner, the relationship of her or his purposes to her or his ends is quite other. To achieve her or his end, qua physician or furniture maker or musician, the practitioner has to find in the achievement of that end an overriding reason for having some purposes rather than others. Individuals who do not acknowledge such an overriding reason will always be apt to have purposes at odds with the end of the practice in which they are engaged. What is required by commitment to a practice is that the individual has the purposes that she or he has just because the end of that particular practice is what it is. So far, I've merely catalogued resemblances and differences between the ways in which we ascribe ends to individuals as identified by Sokolowski. What throws further light on those resemblances and differences is consideration of a third type of ascription that he identifies, where we ascribe ends to individual human beings qua human beings. It's at once clear that such ascriptions raise questions. Consider one crucial difference between non-human animals and humans. The members of each species of non-human animal achieve their determinate end within some particular type of habitat to which they are well adapted. By contrast, human animals have, during their long history, transformed the habitats in which they originated, adapting their environments to their purposes, while extending and also transforming those purposes. I remarked earlier that the members of each species of non-human animal have the purposes they have because their end is what it is. But since humans don't have a limited and given set of purposes, the question arises, why should we suppose that they have a determinate end? 
The same question arises when we contrast what it is to ascribe an end to someone qua physician or furniture maker or musician and what it is to ascribe an end to that same someone qua human being. There are types of activity necessary for success in and characteristic of engagement with each type of practice. But human beings engage in such a wide and changing variety of types of activity, having a similarly wide and changing variety of types of purpose, that it's once again difficult to see how there could be a single determinate end to which the multifarious purposes and activities of human beings could be ordered. What would have to be the case for there to be such an end? There would have to be some one distinctive type of activity characteristic of human beings and of the members of no other species, such that the end of that activity is the end of human beings qua human beings. As with non-human animals, that doubtless complex activity would have to give expression to the range of powers that human beings have by virtue of their distinctive human nature, both the bodily and other powers that they share with non-human animals and those language-using powers that are exclusively human. And as with those engaged in particular practices, the end of their activity would have to provide human beings with an overriding reason for having some purposes rather than others. What kind of activity could this be? And what kind of end could it have? The puzzling thing about these questions is that if there is such an activity, we must all of us somehow or other be engaged in it a good deal of the time. And if there is such an end, we must all of us somehow or other be succeeding or failing in directing ourselves towards it. So why are we so puzzled and how should we proceed? Perhaps what we should do is to consider some insightful contemporary account of the practical lives of human beings, one that excludes application for anything like the concept of a final end and the concept of a type of activity directed towards that end, as we've understood those notions so far, so that we can ask about that account, what has it left out? For just such an account, I turn to the writings of Harry Frankfurt. In my view, Frankfurt has written, it is only in virtue of what we actually care about that anything is important to us. And the question whether there may not be a basis for regarding some things as genuinely important in themselves, regardless of anyone's beliefs or feelings or inclinations, he replies, I quote, in my judgment there is not. There can be no rationally warranted criteria for establishing anything as inherently important. And so at once the concept of a final end as we have characterized it has been excluded. Frankfurt's own starting point is a discussion of our relationship to our desires. We differ from animals of other species in that we're able to stand back from our desires and other motives and reflect upon whether or not we desire to be motivated as we presently are. Hence the importance of the distinction between first and second order desires to which Frankfurt first drew our attention 32 years ago. We identify with some of our desires and not with others and we are free agents insofar as we are motivated by desires with which we identify and by which we desire to be motivated. What we care about are the objects of those of our settled desires with which we identify. I quote again, a person who cares about something is, as it were, invested in it. He identifies himself with what he cares about in the sense that he makes himself vulnerable to losses and susceptible to benefits depending upon whether what he cares about is diminished or enhanced. Thus, he concerns himself with what concerns it. What we care about is in part up to us, but in part not. I quote again, there are some things that we cannot help caring about, and among the things that we cannot help caring about are the things that we love. What we should care about depends on what we do care about most importantly on what we love. And so Frankfurt concludes, our final ends are provided and legitimated by love. But of course, what Frankfurt means by end in this passage 
is quite other than what Sokolowski, or for that matter Aristotle or Aquinas, means. Frankfurt takes a final end to be some effective commitment that provides a terminus for our practical reasoning, but that cannot itself be rationally justified. We cannot dispense on his view with such effective commitments. A life without them, I quote again, could not provide any full satisfaction because it would provide no sense of genuine achievement. But in identifying and setting such final ends, reasoning plays no part since, I quote, the lover does not depend for his loving upon reasons of any kind. Love creates reasons. That is, it provides reasons for acting so as to serve the object of our love. It's not that reason has no part to play in generating actions. Frankfurt is open to the possibility that someone, by discovering through rational scrutiny that the object of their love or other desire is not what they mistakenly took it to be, might no longer love or desire that object. And instrumental reason is of course instrumental reasoning is of course indispensable. But should we at this point be tempted to assimilate Frankfurt's position to Hume's, we would be mistaken. For Frankfurt, unlike Hume, reason has a further and crucial part to play. Hume notoriously held that our preferences can be neither rational nor irrational, neither according with reason nor violating its canons, so that, and I quote from Hume, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. And this thesis Frankfurt rejects. For even though, I quote from Frankfurt, this preference involves no purely logical mistake, we would have to say of someone who chose to destroy the world rather than endure minor discomfort that he must be crazy. His choice is, in Frankfurt's words, lunatic and inhuman, and Frankfurt ascribes to him an irrationality that is not a cognitive deficiency, but a defect of the will. In what does such volitional irrationality consists? It consists not in the agent's preferences differing from ours, but in them being incommensurate with ours. The boundaries of formal reason are transgressed if we believe of some self-contradictory state of affairs that it might really be possible. The boundaries of volitional rationality are transgressed if we don't find certain choices unthinkable. Rationality consists in acknowledging constraints. From whence do these constraints of volitional rationality derive? They are not responses to an independent normative reality. I quote again, the standards of volitional reality and of practical reason are grounded only in ourselves, only in what we cannot help caring about and cannot help considering important. The words cannot help are important. Our judgments about what the norms of practical reason require conform or fail to conform to an objective normative reality which is not up to us. Its objectivity consists just in the fact that it's outside the scope of our voluntary control. An example of such a norm is this. The fact that an action would protect a person's life is universally acknowledged to be a reason for that person to perform the action, even though that person may on occasion have a better reason for doing something else. Why is this so? Frankfurt says, our desire to live and our readiness to invoke this desire as generating reasons for performing actions that contribute to that end are not themselves based on reasons. They derive from and express the fact that, presumably as an outcome of natural selection, we love living. And so it is too with other reason-generating desires, such as those that derive from our love of being intact and healthy, being satisfied and being in touch. Frankfurt concludes that these fundamental necessities of the will are not the outcome of social or cultural habit or individual preferences. They are solidly entrenched in our nature from the start. The contrast with Sokolowski's account could not be starker. For according to Frankfurt, when we have arrived at a well-grounded account of what we do care about, there is no further question to be raised about whether we should care about what we do care about. While according to Sokolowski, this question can always be raised by asking whether what we care about does or does not conduce to the achievement of some end, 
perhaps our end qua physician or musician, perhaps our end qua human being. How then are we to decide between Frankfurt and Sokolowski? My argument will proceed in two stages. In the first, I will identify a set of concepts that are missing from Frankfurt's account, concepts needed for us to distinguish between that which we have good reason to care about and that which we have every reason not to care about, and between that which we have more reason to care about and that which we have less reason to care about. In the second, I shall argue that, insofar as we find application for the concept having good reason to care about and kindred concepts, we presuppose that the concept of an end, understood as Sokolowski understands it, and as Frankfurt excludes it, has application. Suppose that I do indeed care about something or other, and that I, as I am at present, cannot help caring about, about it. It always makes sense, and it often is prudent to ask, whether what I thus care about is worth caring about and whether I should try to change myself so that I become able no longer to care about it. Note that this is a question that I can ask about myself. Frankfurt would have no difficulty in allowing that I may ask about someone else whether what he cares about is worth caring about and reply no, just because, as in the example of Hume, his preferences are too different from, from and at odds with my own. What Frankfurt's account has no place for is the possibility of my having good reasons and my recognizing that I have good reasons for caring about what I do not as yet care about and for no longer caring about what I now care about. And this quite independently of my as yet being motivated to transform my caring. We can and should agree with Frankfurt and also with Hume that nothing can be a reason for action that is not actually or potentially motivating. Yet a reason that motivates us qua reason does so only insofar as it provides us not only with a motive, but also with the conclusion of a characteristically tacit piece of practical reason, reasoning, one which runs, this is a good reason for me to do such and such in these particular circumstances, and there's no better reason for me to do something else, therefore, this is the reason to be acted on. That is, to treat a reason as a good reason for action is to judge that reason to be a better reason for acting in this particular way here and now than any reasons that we may have for acting otherwise. So to what standard do we appeal in judging between competing reasons? In judging one reason superior to another, qua reason, we are not judging that one motivating desire is stronger than another nor giving expression to the relative strength of our desires. How much I care about or love or want something never decides what I have most reason to be, do, or have. Were it to be otherwise, there couldn't be the range of problems that philosophers discuss under the headings acrasia or weakness of will. I may be thought to have a reason for doing this rather than that, I may indeed on occasion have a reason for doing this rather than that, when by so doing I can satisfy some desire, avoid some discomfort, enjoy some pleasure, while by acting otherwise I will achieve nothing that is to the point. Yet to act so as to satisfy a desire, or to avoid a discomfort, or to enjoy a pleasure, is not necessarily to act for any reason at all. What makes it a reason for me to act that by so acting I can satisfy some desire, is that I judge that the good to be achieved by so acting here and now is superior to the good or goods to be achieved by acting otherwise. And so it's only when, by satisfying a desire or avoiding a discomfort or engaging in pleasure, I will achieve some good, that these can furnish me with a reason for action and not just a motive or stimulus. What then is a good? To say of something that it's a good for frogs is to say that it's the kind of thing that if frogs achieve it, characteristically they flourish. To say of something that it's best for this particular frog here and now is to say that it's what this frog needs most to achieve here and now if it's to flourish. And so too with humans. A good for human beings is the kind of thing that if they achieve it, they characteristically flourish. And if something is best for this particular human being here and now, 
It's what this human being needs most to achieve here and now if she or he is to flourish. To act on a good reason, then, is to be directed towards some good, that is, directly or indirectly, towards some end. Good, says Aquinas, has the ratio of an end, by which he means at least this, that I cannot give an account of why something is said to be good without making reference to some end. Of anything towards which we are directed by our desire for it, or by the prospect of pleasure from it, or by our caring about it, we can ask whether we have good reason to be so directed. That is, whether the ends proposed to us by our desire, or by the prospect of pleasure, or by what we care about, are ends that provide us with adequately good reason for pursuing them. Ends provide the measure by which desires, carings, and passions are to be evaluated. Ends provide us with the premises for sound practical reasoning. Learning how to distinguish which kinds of desires, carings, and passions conduce to the achievement of our ends from those that instead frustrate and diminish us, and learning how to redirect and transform our own wants, tastes, and cravings so that they're of the former and not the latter kind must then be central to any life in which there is the possibility of achieving something that could be understood as the completion and perfection of that life. And to have a conception of a completed and perfected life, that is, of a final end for human beings, is to have a conception of a good such that it provides a measure for all other goods, so that those other goods are recognized as goods just because, and insofar as, they contribute to a life which is completed as a whole by the achievement of that final good. Only such a good that could provide us with an overriding reason for directing our activities in one way rather than another, sorry, only such a good as that could provide us with an overriding reason for directing our activities in one way rather than another. But as we noted earlier, there can only be a final good for human beings if there is some type of activity that is distinctively the activity of human beings, the end of which is their final end. What then might that activity be? And once again, we should perhaps approach an answer by asking, what would lives be like from which that activity is notably absent? Consider three examples of lives that have gone wrong. A cares about stamp collecting with the passion of an obsessive. He has neglected responsibilities and alienated friends as his mind has become devoid of other interests. Even other stamp collectors are repelled by his monomania. <laughs> B, by contrast, lacks anything remotely like an obsession. She suffered from early disappointments and responded by refusing to hope for very much and by not caring about anything very much. She is content with small achievements and never attempts anything where she foresees any possibility of failure. Consequently, her powers have never developed as they might have and she's never achieved anything worthwhile. C, unlike both A and B, has developed great abilities and excels in a number of areas, as winner of prizes in his profession of medicine, as marathon runner, as philanthropist. What drives him is an intense wish to do better than others, to run faster than anyone else, to give more money than anyone else. So he devotes himself only to activities in which he's certain that he's going to be able to outstrip others. And his life, therefore, is both one-sided like A's and is devoid of genuine risk-taking as B's, albeit in different ways. Here are three bad ways to live, and we could have listed many more. What do they have in common? For all three, their failure was to evaluate goods at their true worth relative to other goods. And the cause of that failure was to have allowed their desires, their expectations of pleasure or pain, what they cared about to prevent them from recognizing and acting on those reasons for action that would have directed them towards what it was best for them to be, to do, or to have. What was it about them that caused this to happen? It was that none of them had progressed sufficiently in a project that we can describe variously as that of becoming motivated to act only for good reasons, or as that of being able to distinguish what is genuinely desirable from what may seem desirable but in fact is not, or as that of acquiring critical self-knowledge. These are, are, however, not three projects, but one. 
someone moved only by good reasons for acting would in so doing be exercising the power of distinguishing what is desirable for them at particular times and places from what is not. And that is something possible only for those no longer victims of the kind of self-deception that sustains the confusion of the desired with the desirable. How do we come to engage in this project? We begin when, as children, we are motivated not only to make our own the reasons for doing this rather than that, which adults have given us, but also to evaluate those reasons as better or worse, and to act in accordance with our evaluations. The cost of not doing so is to remain not just a child, but childish. And although some children cling to their childishness for protection, every child also wants to move beyond childishness. So children express in their development a desire directed towards the identification and achievement of goods that furnish them with good reasons. And the end to which they may subsequently find themselves directed by that desire is that of being someone who has to some degree identified and aims to achieve the good and the best that it's possible for someone to achieve qua human being. Whether or not they do so find themselves thus directed depends on how far their desires have been transformed into desires only for the genuinely desirable, a transformation that failed to occur in the imaginary lives of A, B, and C. What makes those lives instructive is that they exhibit only in stunted and undeveloped form the salient characteristics of the project that I've just described. The salient characteristics, that is, of that type of activity which is specific to human beings as rational agents, the end of which is our end as human beings. But some will object, that surely is not a type of activity. Types of activity are as various as mountain climbing, chimney cleaning, coal mining, playing the cello, and trimming one's toenails. But the project of developing and exercising the power of being moved by good reasons to achieve the genuinely desirable is not one more such type of activity, something undertaken in the time left over from mountain climbing, chimney cleaning, coal mining, playing the cello, and trimming one's fingernails. It's a project less or more successfully implemented in all these different types of activity, indeed in every type of activity, to which the reply must be, indeed, that is among the distinguishing marks of this type of activity. To what final end is this type of activity directed? It can only be that end, that good, which is presupposed by our evaluation of and motivation by all other goods. It can only be that good which provides an overriding reason for acting so that we're directed towards its achievement. So making the case that it's only because and insofar as other goods are means to it or parts of it that they're goods. It can only be that good which completes and perfects our flourishing by providing our desire with an object whose desirability is incomparable with any other. But is there such a final end? This is a theoretical question that I shall not pursue here, but it has an answer only if each of us is able to ask and answer the questions, what is my final end and what subordinate ends should I pursue here and now as practical questions, one whose answers give expression to an awareness of a directedness towards that end in our choices and actions. Such practical questions and answers will necessarily be framed in terms of the particularities of each agent's situation, in terms of the contingencies of her or his social and historical context, of her or his responses to the accidental and the unpredictable. An accurate account of what it would be for one or more particular individuals to be more or less coherently directed towards their final end would, just because of its concern with particularities, have to be, as I remarked earlier, a narrative account. Whether a true history of real individuals or a novelist's or dramatist's account of imaginary characters. This is why the brief stories that I told about A, B, and C are not to be regarded as mere illustrations of theoretical generalizations. These were fictional narratives of individual failures, narratives of the particularities of failure, of the failure of each of those individuals to be directed towards her or his final end. And such failures can only be understood in and through such narratives. Theoretical generalizations and narratives complement one another, 
Indeed, each requires the other if it is to be fully intelligible. One interesting consequence is that it's not possible either to engage in the inquiries of moral philosophy or to teach it as an academic subject, except in part by making use of histories, novels, biographies, short stories, plays. For it's only through such works that we can understand how the concepts of a final end and of subordinate ends have application. But there's even more than this to the relationship between the concept of an end and narrative form. What the structure of a story is, what kind of story it is, depends upon the kind of ending that it has. And what kind of ending it has depends upon the relationship of one or more of its central characters to some end generally and characteristically some important, but far from final end. Yet if, as I've suggested, our relationship to our subordinate ends is always also a relationship to our final end, then even small successes or failures in respect of subordinate ends have a larger significance. So, without the concept of an end, we would, it seems, lack the concept of a story. Yet things are a little more complicated than that. In trying to answer the question of the relationship between ends and endings, ends and stories, I'm strongly indebted to the work of Francis Slade, who has argued that, and I quote, the narrative arts presuppose the ontological priority of ends to purposes, because without that priority there is nothing to be revealed about the adequacy or inadequacy of human purposes to the completeness of human life. It is on Slade's view, as on Sokolowski's and mine, the ends of our activities that provide the measure of our purposes, and also of our desires, choices, and intentions. And therefore, without reference to ends, we would not be able to understand either each of our lives as a whole, or each of our particular projects, either as completed and perfected, or as in various ways and from various causes, frustrated and imperfect. But that we have this kind of understanding and share it with others, is presupposed both in our telling of stories and in our listening to and responding to them. Such a thesis must seem not just compelling but unproblematic when we consider the vast majority of stories, from Homer through authors as various as Euripides, Ovid, Dante, Shakespeare, Stern, Flaubert, Henry James. We encounter in such authors a variety of conceptions of the final end of human beings, of what the range of subordinate ends is, and of how the latter are related to the former. But in all these very different types of story, it's some set of particular goods of subordinate ends that is at stake, and the qualities of mind and heart of the protagonists are revealed in their success or failure in achieving those goods, so that their ends are indeed the measure of their purposes and activities. But with the 20th century, new kinds of storyteller and new kinds of story emerge. Some of them storytellers who take the concept of an end to be a metaphysical illusion, and some of them stories of characters who inhabit imaginary worlds constructed so as to put in question the very concept of an end. Slade considers two different and contrasting examples, the screenplays of Quentin Tarantino and the novels and short stories of Kafka. Let me consider them in terms that take us a little beyond Slade's account so that he must not be held responsible for the detail of what I say. Tarantino's characters, as Slade points out, inhabit a fictional world in which ends have been erased, so that there are only rival and conflicting desires and purposes. Among them, the desires and purposes of some characters to give aesthetic form and grace to the exercise of their skills and to the violence of their encounters. Tarantino himself, in similar aesthetic fashion, imposes outcomes on his characters which make them purposefully unlifelike but aesthetically disturbing. Author and characters are at one in both grace and violence. So there are endings, but there are only artfully imposed arbitrary endings. Kafka, by contrast, shows us what is recognizably our world as we sometimes fear it to be, a world in which the possibility that human beings have ends and not just purposes and desires, the possibility that there is indeed some point and purpose to what we are doing, is never quite foreclosed 
but nonetheless we continue in a protracted, although never final, state of suspicion that in the end there is almost nothing but the arbitrary, that at most, I quote from the Great Wall of China, there is a goal but no way, what we call way is only wavering. So there is characteristically no ending to the stories, but simply a breaking off. Sometimes a work left unfinished, sometimes a work artfully incomplete at the moment of its finish. Once again, although in a very different way, author and characters are at one. Both Tarantino and Kafka illustrate and confirm Slade's thesis that narrative art as it has been understood so far presupposes the ontological priority of ends to purposes, even if they do so by showing what the absence of ends amounts to. But they at least open our minds to the possibility that there is still a further step to be taken, one in which the exercise of narrative art finally succeeds in portraying a human world that is compellingly recognizable as the real world and yet is wholly devoid of ends. This would have to be an exercise of such art that communicated both a sense of reality lacking in Tarantino's fictions and an absence of hope more radical than Kafka's. Were there such a narrative, it might seem to offer a radical counterexample to Slade's thesis and so also to my own. What characteristics would the characters in such a story have to possess? If my earlier argument in this paper is correct, they would be motivated by desires, by passions, by their caring for this or that, but they could not treat these as reason affording, since lacking application for the concept of an end, they would lack the resources to evaluate them as better or worse reasons. Each of them would be unable to ask concerning themselves whether what she or he cared about was worth caring about, although they might judge concerning others that what they cared about was not worth caring about. Of them, that is to say, that of these characters, Frankfurt's account would hold good. There would in such a story be no such thing as success or failure qua human being or movement toward such success or failure, although there might be the burden of caring, of the loss of desire, of the frustration of hope, of the disappointment of expectation. Above all, there could in such a narrative be no finality, for there would always be more to come, more of the same, except for, we might suppose, that accidental dental termination afforded by death. It might well seem that no novelist could find in such material a novel, that the great art that would be required to give narrative form to the thought that there is nothing more to human beings than this would be just too disproportionate to its subject matter. But in fact, there is such a novel, one of the great European novels of the 20th century, Cray Nakili by Martino Coyne, published in 1949. Not just its greatness, but its very existence have gone largely unrecognized, perhaps because it's written in Irish, a wonderfully impressive Irish, an Irish whose translation presents unusual difficulties. There is indeed a splendid film made of Cray Nakili with English subtitles, and the title is translated as Graveyard Dust. But the only translation of the text into English of which I know is in an unpublished doctoral dissertation submitted at Berkeley in 1984, and the only other translation of which I know is into Norwegian. It's a novel of very many voices. They are the voices of the dead in a graveyard on Ireland's western seaboard, speaking sometimes to each other, sometimes to themselves, expressing the feelings and cares that they brought with them to the grave, enmities, resentments, anxieties, pleasure in other people's misfortunes, obsessions, pretensions, wishes to puncture other people's pretensions. Those now dead are forever, endlessly, what they were when alive. The central character among this host of characters, Katrina Fatten, is not only angrily resentful that her son buried her in the 15 shilling plot in the graveyard, rather than in the pound, the 20 shilling plot, but nurses a bitter grievance of many years against her still living sister, while also filled with malice towards her son's mother-in-law, Nora Shanin, another inhabitant of the graveyard. From time to time, the newly dead and buried bring news of what has happened more recently above ground among the living, and to each of them, Katrina anxiously inquires whether her son has as yet arranged for the green basalt headstone 
on which her heart is set. Like the dreadful Katrina, the large cast of other characters are moved by what they care about, by what they can't help caring about. Sometimes one of them will judge that what someone else cares about is not worth caring about and mock them or chide them. So Nora Shanine complains bitterly that the schoolmaster is too preoccupied with the gossip that his widow had immediately after his death taken up with Bilikai and Posta, Bilikai the mailman, when, as an educated man, the schoolmaster should be cultivating his mind. So Katrina Fadden, in turn, mocks Nora's pretensions uh, to culture. But none of them are able to ask about themselves, is what I care about worth caring about? The possibility of an appeal to something other than and beyond their own cares has been excluded. So in this respect, at least, they are what Frankfurt takes all of us to be. In O'Coin's magic wor imagined world, there are no reason affording ends of human activity. And such activity, the activity of conversations and monologues, has become unending. It's not that nothing happens. There is even an election with rival candidates from the one pound plot, the 15 shilling plot, and the 10 shillings and sixpence plot, during which the latter, the half guinea candidate, gives a Marxist analysis of the class structure of the graveyard. <laughs> O'Coin here, O'Coin here was parodying views that were very close to his own. But his, like all the rhetoric, is nothing more than self-serving self-expression talk amounting to nothing but more talk, so that on the novel's last page, there are still voices competing with other voices, and no finality and no prospect of finality. O'Coin well, succeeded brilliantly in showing us both what human life would be if it were deprived of ends, and how, if so deprived, it would be unending. But in so doing, he also showed us that and how we, the living, are unlike the dead of Crane Achille how and that their world lacks crucial features of ours, how and that we are able to engage in rational self-questioning as they are not. And in a curious way, as I suggested, he shows us what the world would be like if Frankfurt's view of it were correct. Uh, more than this, Crane Achille is a work of great linguistic art, not only giving expression to the purposes of O'Coin as an artist, <coughs> but vindicating those purposes just because it's a novel in which its author achieves the end of the novelist's art in exemplary fashion. The voices in this novel may speak only through O'Coin's book, but he, in making those voices heard, speaks as they cannot speak, acts as they cannot act, achieving a finality in completing and perfecting the art of his novel, which is wholly absent from their afterlives. The author pursuing and achieving his end qua author is what is not found among the characters in his book. So Slade's thesis and Sokolowski's distinctions and arguments and my own arguments directed to justifying further Slade's and Sokolowski's conclusions are confirmed rather than refuted by O'Coin's masterpiece. What I've tried to achieve by those arguments is twofold. First to establish that the underlying unity in our ascriptions of ends derives from a basic conception of an end as the end of some type of activity, as that which completes and perfects such activity, and that beings of different kinds have different ends because and insofar as each has a specific nature which is expressed in its specific activity or range of activities. And secondly, to show that it's not just that without ends there are no endings, but also that of any individuals to whose activity an end is to be described, there is always a story to be told, a story that has an ending. So it's also true that there are no ends without corresponding endings. And so I end. <laughs>
Um, and I wanted to say they weren't really literate, but I couldn't figure out why. Um, it seems like part of what you're saying would explain why. Um, but I, I haven't quite worked that out. Um, do, you, do you think so? I think they, I don't know the kind of book you talked about, but I think I can understand it from what you said. But it seems to me that such a book is trying to do two incompatible things, and perhaps it's this that makes it not literature. The author telling the narrative re retrospectively is able to identify and either to state or to presuppose, very often presupposes <coughs> rather than state, the end towards which the characters are directed and which they succeed or fail to achieve. So in Jane Austen's novels, the end to which some of the characters as young women are directed is the achieving of a certain kind of marriage. And they succeed or fail in one of two ways. They succeed or fail to get married, but they also succeed or fail in understanding what the end of marriage is. And it's very important that that's the crucial end their activity. Uh, in life, when we are actually living it, we're directed towards ends in a very different way in which the author directs the characters. Because the future is open. And everything turns on what we take to be a good reason for acting this way rather than that, and above all, what we take to be an overriding reason for acting in one way rather than another. Now, the kind of book that we're talking about mixes the author's point of view and the agent's point of view and asks you to be both at once. And it seems to me that's making an incoherent demand. It's a game that can't be really played well. And I would think that's why it breaks down. Does this seem right or not? It also seems like one of the problems with these books is they don't have a single end. They begin to vary. And, and that's right. And that's so it's not even clear what story it is. I mean, nobody's future is that old. <laughs> I have a question about the, um, the Frank Furchin nature of the graveyard society. Um, I can see that because the people can't reflect much directly on what they care about, that given that they already care about inadequate things, their lives are going to be useful, but suppose when they all arrive in the graveyard, they all been very happy, optimistic people, what they cared about with other people's successes, and so forth, then why wouldn't they have a happy society about the graveyard? Whenever the news came, they would always want to know, has anyone learned something? You know what I'm saying? In other words, why? Is it intrinsic to its Frank Burkiness that it be so dismal? No, <laughs> not at all. But let's think about this in terms of the novel that you've just started writing. <laughs> we have this graveyard full of people, and they all die happy. And I have a particular difficulty in making that credible. That's a bit of We'll put that one on one side. And now they can no longer do any of the things that make them happy. And it seems to be that all the ones make them unhappy. Uh, it's very important that the characters in O'Coin's novel weren't unhappy when they were above ground. They lived lives that are various, or many of them are, and they actually liked going around and being nasty to each other. I'm very sorry that now they can't be effective, right? In, in this way. But had you asked them whether they were enjoying life up to this point, um, many of them would have said yes. And it's their insistence that the way they do things is all right. This is the way to go. This is what we mean. They're not. I, I gave a wrong impression of the novel. If I gave the impression that this was a novel of unhappy people. It's not. It's a novel of standard people once they have died and have nothing with them but what they brought them and no possibility of doing anything other than caring about it. Um, <coughs> One of the things that motivated O'Connor, O'Connor is a very, very interesting man. He grew up in western seaboard in Galway. He became a schoolmaster in the 1930s. He understood very well that what was happening to the children he taught was something that he couldn't remedy only in the classroom. 
and so he became a militant Republican, time with the Republic, not strongly socialist. And a great deal of his life had gone from there. He was very against the church for all sorts of reasons, some of them quite good ones. Uh, what he shows you are people from whom he has stripped away all their Catholicism. This is a very interesting thing. I mean, there are, it's, it's a graveyard, there's a church nearby, there are instruments concerning priests. But they have no control of the Catholic faith. I mean, you perfectly well with these people who are imbued with the Catholic faith. They don't have any political hopes either. Politics comes in only to be parodied and so on, although he himself was deeply politically committed. But he's, he's asking, what happens to people if you take away from them what is involved in religion and politics? And in so doing, he does this by stripping away anything that could be an end. They have purposes all that. They have all sorts of passions. But what goes wrong with them isn't they just have the purpose and the passions that they have. It is there's nothing else. But there's no ending. Everything's going to go on forever. Please. Um, Dr. McIntyre, um, after virtue, you described very well how uh, the rejection of ends has reduced contemporary ethics to absurdity. Now, you seem to imply that ends are as important in art as they are in morality. So I was just wondering, do you think that uh, aesthetics, the field of aesthetics, suffers a similar fate from the rejection of ends? Well, let, let me say two things. Um, first, just going back to a point, a novel. What's very striking about the novel is that it points very clearly as an end to a novelist. And it is very clear that the author has a purpose that is related to ends in quite different ways to the characters in the novel. So something very, this is one of the things that makes the novel very impressive, that all the time you are um, being confronted by the author as well as by the characters, and they're very, very different. Now, this does suggest that it matters very much that the artist has ends. And the problem in thinking about ends in the arts is, of course, like the problem of thinking about ends of human action generally, is that the arts are so various and the history of any particular art goes in so many different directions that um, it, it would be quite impossible to pick out something as the end of painting. I mean, if you go through just the history of painting from the late 18th century, and you think about Constable and Turner on the one hand, or you think about Bourbet uh, and various French painters, and then you think the arrival of Impressionism and post-Impressionism, and then into Cubism, and just trace that bit of the script. Here is art going in many different directions, just one art painting. So what could the end be? Well, perhaps the way to get it in, by the in paper and in other ways, is to ask, what would it be like if art had no end? Except of what the end of art is, I think. And the best way to do that is to look at the contemporary art market. <laughs> because what has happened in the arts is, 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 is quite stunning as an event. First of all, simply the multiplication, um, the quantity. I mean, people don't think about this, but consider the fact now that every bank, every merchant house, everything hangs paintings on its wall. And there are people busy working through agents supplying these. But consider also the way in which collectors now operate with art and investment. And here a study of the activities of Charles Saatchi would be particularly illuminating. And what people have got to do at this point, what you can see is that the criterion for art is to go further. And to go further, that is to do something that is different as such. Now, if you look back at, say, Cubism, it's very clear that the Cubists were going further, that Brock and Picasso in his Cubist period doing things that nobody had done before. But that wasn't why they were doing them. Uh, they were doing them because of certain very interesting problems about visual abstraction and the relationship of objects with geometry of place and so on about this. Uh, and it's when you ask, ask when Picasso, and Picasso in all his curious phases, did something, he was always solving a problem. The interesting in the arts is you can only say what the problem is after it's solved. 
it doesn't look exactly like a problem that people keep thinking. And immediately one sees, here is a question that's been answered. Damien Hurst doesn't solve problems. Uh, he markets different objects. Um, and there isn't anything that you can say about this article. This is a thesis that would take, I mean, you have to give me a semester. Uh, it, it shows you the direction of the discussion. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, one question I In one way, I wasn't talking about, I mean, some people talk about using literature and philosophy classes. Right. That wasn't really what I was talking about. I think in doing moral philosophy, narratives are indispensable. And they're indispensable because they are the necessary complement to generalization. That generalization in ethics need to be cashed in in terms of example. These are not just illustrations. The meaning of the generalization is only given in and through the particular kinds of narratives in which it's exemplified. So when I, if I set out a set of abstract theses in ethics about truth and lying, or about anything you like in this way, I only know what these amount to if I know what they would amount to for particular agents in particular kinds of situations. <coughs> why you can only explain the generalizations with reference to particulars. Now, it's better still if the particulars are actual historical particulars. But Hume understands this very well. I mean, it's very important when you teach Hume to use his history of England uh, as well as his philosophical writings. Because what he says about ethics is exemplified in the way in which he tells the stories. Uh, and he himself was, was, was very clear about this. Um, and, for example, his judgments about King Charles I or Cromwell or the like all exemplify things which he talks about in the treatise and the inquiry. <coughs> that um, you should complement the idea of uh, a narrative and a story with its ending with paintings, as, in particular with portraits. Uh, a portrait really doesn't give you the narrative part, but it does give you the ending. <laughs> it gives you the point of that life. I, I mean, classical portraits. Uh, and in fact, non-representational art might have a problem here because it might fall into the same uh, difficulty as the non-narrative stories that you pointed out as being difficult to achieve. Good. I mean, George Orwell said, by the age of 50, everybody has the face that he deserves. That, in a way, would make the Kotlowski's point already. This is to say there was a connection between Narrative. Wittgenstein said that the face was a portrait of the soul. Um, it matters very much that that portrait expresses a relationship of the sitter to an end. And a very striking example of this is the story of Graham Sutherland's portrait of Winston Churchill. Uh, when Churchill was about to retire from the House of in 1954, the House of Commons decided that they would come together a portrait in a literal sense, come together individual members subscribe money in order to have a portrait. And Sutherland was picked out as a portrait painter who was known Churchill admired and was asked if he would do this painting of Churchill. Churchill was leaving office as prime minister partly because he was already showing some symptoms of mental failure, though in a rather mild form. And he was essentially being edged out by his own party in a very polite way. And he was deeply resentful of this. 
Sutherland had sitting with Churchill, and although he allowed Churchill to see some of the things that he did at the beginning of the portrait, he refused to allow Churchill to see the portrait in its developed and finished form. And when the portrait was presented to Churchill in the House of Commons, when it was unveiled, uh, Churchill and a number of people were completely horrified. Uh, and what they were horrified by was the truthfulness of the portrait. Um, the portrait showed somebody, I don't think it was Churchill himself who said this, uh, but somebody who was unqualifiedly ruthless, but also touched with senility. <laughs> and, uh, it was an extraordinary painting of the face with the flames separating and falling uh, Churchill accepted the portrait with some good grace, like it, he made a thanks. He didn't allow the portrait to be shown after that, and after he died, his wife destroyed it, um, having promised him that she would never let anyone see it. We do know what it was like because there were very, very good reproductions of the time. And so it was, very, it was rather grateful. Now, what Churchill was doing at this point was essentially refusing the truth about himself. An extraordinary difficulty to accept. I have an enormous sympathy. Um, at the time, I had the opportunity of asking the age Congress, a very great art historian and art critic what his view of the portrait was, and he said, breach of contract. In fact, when you do personal portraits this on this occasion, you don't expect somebody to do this kind of thing. I mean, put it this way, Sutherland should have been told we don't want a great work of art. But this just makes your point absolutely. And I think great portraits are like this. They, they, they are where they, they presuppose the notion of an end. Now, when you come to non-narrative art, it's worth at this point looking. There was an exhibition um, recently in London of those paintings in which Picasso began from a portrait by Velasquez or began from some classic painting and transformed it. And these are extraordinary studies. They are studies that comment on what Velasquez or whoever it was showing And they bring out your point even more clearly. And what Picasso had to do in order to do this was to use what was essentially non-figurative techniques that enabled us to see the figurative art being taken apart. Um, and I think that in fact non-figurative, I mean some abstract art does this extraordinarily well. It, it isn't of course passing the same kind of verdict on human life. But the point of is the enormous. Another point uh, would be that uh, it seems to me what you developed in your paper was the idea that if we are giving reasons that are on a lower and more immediate level for what we do, that we can't be doing that unless we have a sense of the reason. Absolutely. Uh, and um, that really is what, say, in philosophy, Aristotle and others would do say even in politics or in the ethics of what is the human life, which is what is the good for us. And they're doing it by disengaging a little bit out of the practical situation, uh, because although they are agents at the moment when they're reflecting on this larger picture or the, the final picture, they're not uh, merely one of the agents among many. They have a little detachment, and perhaps a story does that as well. It points to the best life, or the good life, or the thing that's so hard to capture because it's not distinguished from any other things. And uh, so there's a nice parallel there between the, the novelist or the narrator and the philosopher, uh, each reflecting in a different way on what is terminal. Now, your reflections are more philosophical than narrative, but you use narrative and inevitable stories of action is part of it. Yes, I think there are, I mean, there are at least three levels, but maybe more. Um, first of all, there's the little level of the agent acting immediately here and now, and even by acting without articulating it, taking it that 
this is a better reason than that. And the basic piece of my paper, which I identified quite correctly, which is that in picking out something as a subordinate good, but as what it is good and best to be here now, maybe something relatively trivial, I am nonetheless also directed towards my ultimate good. And I wouldn't have a reason for acting here and now unless this reason was directing me towards my end, my final end. So that's the first level. And it's very clear agents, when they do this, don't characteristically have this in mind. Very rarely that we have it in mind. And if we did have it in mind, we would be a great deal less good at acting than we are. But we continue to be paralyzed. But now there's the second order of reflection. And this again is the reflection of the agent. Too often retrospectively asked, did I really act on that view? And now, at this point, it starts raising the questions about the connection. And essentially, the philosopher seems to me simply somebody who's gone further down this road. It's continuity. The person who tells the story is commenting in a different way moving in a different direction, namely showing how, in fact, as reason giving and acting progresses, directedness towards the end becomes apparent in this way rather than that, so that one passes the verdict. And in this way, the person who tells the story is actually doing something that the philosopher can't do. So the philosopher, as it were, the philosopher can do lots of things that the person telling the story can't do, but the person telling the story does things that the philosopher can't do. I mean, put it this way, uh, at the Day of Judgment, a great many stories will be told, but there will be very little philosophical reflection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that may not be good theology, but... <laughs> you know Harry Frankfurt's little uh, profitable uh, book, essay uh, on board. And uh, I've always liked, or thought I've liked, the distinction that he tries to make between lying and bullshit. The liar is one who knows the truth and narrates against it. And uh, the BSer is one who is simply has no capacity for the truth and has no regard for it per se. I've always been a little worried in the essay about the way he doesn't seem to make a moral evaluation between the relative good of one of those or the other, or the bit of it. But in reflecting on, on your comments, it seems to me that I mean, when you think about how much both liars and bullshitters uh, are storytellers, they're heavily reliant on narrative, that ultimately that's the distinction that I that I thought I liked it really doesn't hold up very much, that, that maybe the, the BSer is one who is in narrating, always potentially in the act activity of lying against against BSing. That, 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 that there's a in some ways I, I don't know your I mean, I can't put it together, but your comment would maybe think that maybe that distinction that Frankfurt makes there is really a one that squares with, with reality. We, we, we want to have a name for this thing called BS. We want to think it's okay and, and so on, but at another level it's not real. It really is lying. Well, let's, let's, let me make two different points that are related. My basic thesis by Frankfurt is this, and I should say I have enormous respect for Frankfurt's work. Um, and it, it seems to be it raises the crucial issues for ethics in a very big way. Um, on Frankfurt's view, if I've understood it correctly, I may say of other people that what they care about is not worth caring about because I'm just judging their carings by mind. But I can't have uh, my own ultimate caring about what they worth caring about because I have no standard external to care. So I can't have good reasons or bad reasons for caring about what I ultimately care about. And this seems to be basically wrong for the reasons I might give. The problem for Harry Frankfurt is he's a very good human being. And so he actually cares about the things that are worth caring about. And so he cares very much about truth, for example. He's one of the most scrupulous people I know. Uh, every way. And so
So for him, the distinction between lying and bullshit matters a very great deal. Um, the liar actually shows in an odd way a concern for truth. And he cares about truth, and he sees that the liar is in an odd way paying respect for truth by pretending truth. Bullshit is not even interested. Bullshit is interested in producing an impression. Bullshit is engaged in it. And he takes it therefore that it's a line to be drawn. And he invites people who care about the same things that he does to agree with them. Now the interesting thing is that actually you know, the mental distinction he makes with you will read caring with him about or not. Um, we deal with liars quite differently from what we deal with bullshit. Once we've identified someone as a liar, we are very careful indeed not to we pay him the respect of not believing what he says, finding it unpersonal. With the bullshit, uh, well, if I've got ten minutes to waste. <laughs> <laughs> Is 
concern in coming with the natural discernment of ends. But it's good for me, short term, long term, play a part of being told. Good. Let me make a distinction of their own love. I want to argue that it is in finding correct good reasons for doing this rather than that here and now that I am directed towards my final end or not. And it is in my present having of reasons, evaluating reasons, acting on reasons that I will achieve or not achieve my final end. Now, because this is so, it's the case that the reasons that I have, the reasons that determine my directedness, are always reasons bound up with my situation here and now. And so I will think about this in the terms that are given to me by my culture and social circumstances. So if I happen to live in the 13th century as, say, someone teaching in the University of Paris, the decisions that will confront me, the reasons that I will have for deciding things will be very different from my situation if I were teaching at, say, Cambridge University in the early 20th century. The particularities of the situation will be different. But that doesn't mean that I am, so to speak, a victim of my cultural circumstances. My ability to evaluate <coughs> is an ability to deploy standards of what is a better or worse reason for a human being to behave, which are independent of my particular situation and circumstances. And so there is a discernment, what you're asking about, there is a discernment of ends and what it is to have a good reason, which is independent of circumstances and culture. But it's always going to be deployed in and through the culture of the time. And that's what misleads people into certain kinds of relativism. Is that going to answer it?
larger political unit finally to something like a nation state. Now, what you find in the modern world is that at a certain point, there's no longer a shared notion of the common good. That is, it's no longer possible to have a kind of reason here, which is going to have any kind of compelling force, because there is no notion of what the end of human beings is, a human being, let alone their ends, trade, say, positions, and various other things. And then this becomes a very interesting question of how you respond and how you deal with it. And it's very important that that's a second order response. The way in which you respond to the breakdown of political life understood as Aristotle understood that the common good means you've got a certain kind of second order politics. Politics of how you deal with no politics. Uh, and that then becomes a very important and interesting question. Uh, and that will take us right away from what we're talking about. But that goes down the road to my back. What's your question to my friend? Yes. I was uh, wondering in regards to the, uh, the correspondence you knew between ends and how they must necessarily have an ending, and how that uh, the idea and the understanding of the immortality of the soul would have an impact on that, something that seems to not I would have to talk about quite different things. And that would take us too far away. I mean, everything I say, I argue for, has to do with this present life. You know, how we are at the end, we are given this present life. How we fail or succeed in relation to those ends will determine what happens to us in the world to come. But about that, I'm not. That, that's theology. Uh, if, if I'm the agent, right, um, at, at, the, at the present, and I'm trying to determine whether I do this or I do that, and I'm, there's two types of agents, and I'm a guy, I'm a guy who thinks about being a good surgeon, all right, that's, that's one, that's the end, and, I, and the other type being a guy who wants to perform a successful surgery, a, bra a brain surgery. Can you comment about the difference in sort of the moral mechanics of the decision making that, that I might go through or that either in the first order or in that second order that you talked about, that second level? Sorry, what, um, was, what was the first alternative I didn't? I want to be a good surgeon right, yeah. or, or uh, I want to perform a successful surgery. Can you kind of walk us through some of, some ideas about the contrast of the moral mechanics of, of that present as the on that first level or that second level? Okay, there isn't anything to wanting to be a good surgeon other than wanting to act well as a surgeon on particular occasions. Okay. And to act well as a surgeon on particular occasions is to act for the ends of which the surgeon acts, the great surgeon acts. Now, two things we need to think about here. The first is surgeons are also human beings, and so the ends of the surgeon who's a surgeon are going to be related to being a good surgeon is going to be or isn't going to be part of being a good human being. So there'll be considerations that come in that can't be learned from surgery. There's always going to be considerations that are important to the surgeon, quite apart from surgery. Let, let's take an example. Um, I've known surgeons who if you could operate, they did. Period, that is. And they did very well. But it never occurred to them that it might actually be better for the patient not to be operated on, to actually be left with whatever it was, because actually life might be better in this way, in its way. So the first thing you see about the decision is certainly that making a decision that this is a case in which I ought to operate, there are going to be more than medical criteria going to be criteria about the way in which this affects life of the patient. And then there's going to be the question of what the outcome is going to be if the operation is successful. Not worrying so much now about what happens if it fails. But being a good surgeon is going to take every possible care. But if it succeeds, uh, 
what would I have done for the patient? Um, what will the patient then have to do next to find her or his way back into the social world? Okay. So it's a question of whether to operate and a question of when you operate, what and how you follow up on this. Um, let me give you an illustration of what it is to be a, an excellent surgeon. It will be very important in this way. Uh, when I was 40 years old or so, I had to be operated on for kidney stone in a hospital in London. Um, the hospital was, it was a men's ward, of course. Everybody had urinary problems or kidney troubles of some sort or another. When you went into the ward, you were first, you were introduced to two people. One of them, both of them had suffered from complaint as close to yours as possible. And the first one had, was two weeks ahead of you. And the second one was one week ahead of you. It was their job to tell you what was going to happen to you. They had to tell you, not the surgeon. The surgeon didn't tell you. The surgeon devised this routine whereby you learn from other parents, patients. And you learn in one week you were going to have to tell somebody what would happen to him. And in two weeks you were going to have to do the same. So, and this was 90% of the people in the ward, ward were working class. In fact, that guy was the only patient who wasn't working class. Uh, many of them were elderly men. They'd all been in manual occupations. They weren't necessarily tremendously articulate. But they did this extremely well. And they did this because they, they translated the medical and surgical terminology into terminology that everybody in the ward would understand. So you learned about your future, and you also learned about your future after you left the ward. People who had been in the ward came back <coughs> to revisit the people who were still there, who became this kind of community. And so people talked about what it was like going back into the world after he'd spent three weeks in hospital and whatever it was. I take it, it would, I take it this, uh, this surgeon was technically a very fine surgeon indeed, but I take it that understanding as a surgeon that the communication of the information, the way in which, the way out into the world afterwards was prepared was just as important as the surgeon. And it's very important that his surgical decisions were made in the context of information sharing of this kind. Any of you who've ever had operations made sort will know this rarely happens. <laughs> and it's very important that it can happen and that it makes this kind of difference. Um, does this begin to answer your question? It does very well, thank you very much. I just finished reading the book of Who's Virtue. And uh, in that book, as I understand it, I'm saying it correctly. Uh, you are basing yourself on facts rather than Aristotle's uh, philosophical anthropology. Without this further step, 
Well, let, let's talk about the way in which I think practice is fundamental and the way in which I think it's not. People often don't notice that towards the end of the tense book of the Lycomachy and Ethics, Aristotle says that the test of these matters is practice. And that's that counts as more than any theoretical argument. And it's very important that there's only a particular kind of practice that does something. Um, when we engage in practices, and I've written here about structural practices of various kinds, and practices in which construction workers engage, in which farmers engage, in which fishing crews engage, you find that the ends of the practice are given. What it is to be a good member of the fishing crew, what it is to be a good musician, good surgeon, whatever it is, within the practice that the ends are given. And you have to learn how to make the day-to-day -day decisions as a construction worker, as a musician, as a member of the fishing crew, which will in fact achieve the goods of the practice. It isn't that the good of the practice is something over and above the goods that you achieve through these everyday decisions. It is that which is presupposed in the making of these decisions. Now, people who have been engaged in practices, who have been habituated to practices, will already to some extent have been transformed. They will have learned that they have to have certain kinds of qualities of mind and character that do well, that they have to conform to certain precepts if they're in fact of the right kind of social relationships with the people with whom they work and the like. And when such people press one stage further and ask, but are the goods that I'm pursuing in this practice, how are they to be valued relative to other goods in my life? Given that I'm a member of the fishing crew, I'm also a member of the family. I'm also a member of the sports club. I also participate in various other activities. So what place should these different goods have in my life? It's in this way that they raise the question of the final end. And therefore, people who've engaged in practices ask the question, for the sake of what am I doing this ultimately, and what kind of person am I not to become in order to achieve my ends, find that they are asking Aristotelian questions and can be satisfied only by Aristotelian types of answers. And when they are given Aristotelian answers, they're able to identify them as the kind of answers they are, and they're able to evaluate them in various ways. Consider a quite different way in which one might approach Aristotle. Consider trying to teach Aristotle to a class of undergraduates. You must have heard of them. <laughs> age, 18 to 20 years old, who have had no worthwhile life experience at all, and who have often been subjected to confusing and disorienting high school teaching. <laughs> and what you do is you put them in an ethics class and you introduce them to a variety of theories. Here is Bill, here is Kant and here is Aristotle, and so on. And it turns out there is no way of deciding between these theoretical claims. And people, they are smart, they may be intrigued by one of these theories and moved by it. Generally, they try to never take this subject again. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that it's crucial that Aristotelianism at the level of theory is one more theory. At the level of theory, there is actually no way of saying it. Uh, at the level of practice, there is. And one can, I think, then articulate practice in theoretical terms. This is the next step. And at this point, you bring out the presuppositions of good practice, and you discover that these presuppositions involve what you call anthropology. But at that point, you have reason for thinking of people in terms of one set of concepts rather than another. And that you don't have apart from the right kind of experience. And I take it this is Aristotle's own point. Aristotle says, unless you develop the right habits, unless you develop the right experiences, unless your passion for order, you will not be able to be responsive to argument in ethics. That theoretical considerations will just not move. 
might make a difference if you run that. Way, 
and people don't want to pay us this or that because they have their purposes. This isn't in the realm of evidence at all. People think about success or failure in these ways precisely because they don't bring the concept of an end to bear on their heart. So it isn't that people don't want the concept of an end because they don't want to fail. They are not wanting to fail to found up with the way they are tied to their purpose. I, I hear people say several times, like, oh, I'm a failure, or even I'm a failure in life, but they always say it with a smile and ironically, which indicates to me that they don't actually believe that that's possible, because they don't believe in that that's other No, no, this is just a neat shorthand saying, I ain't been doing, I ain't doing so well like, relative to my own purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and say much more about the way in which uh, the point treated it. 